All right, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining during your lunch break and over VC. Um, I'm really excited to introduce Myra Strober. She's a Stanford professor and author who's here to share some really great tips on how to juggle your work life and your home life. Um, I'm going to jump right in because we're a few minutes behind, and she's going to read an excerpt from one of her books, um, go over some slides, and answer any questions that you may have. Uh, so Myra is a labor economist and the professor emerita at the School of Education at Stanford University. She is also the professor of economics at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University. Her research and consulting focus on gender issues at the workplace and work and family. She is the author of numerous articles on occupational segregation, women in the professions and management, the economics of child care, feminist economics, and the teaching of economics. She was the founding director of the Michelle R. Clayman Institute for Gender Research at Stanford, and she was also the first chair of the National Council for Research on Women, a consortium of US centers for research on women, which today has more than 100 member centers. Um, over the years, Myra has consulted with several corporations on improved utilization of women in management and on work family issues. She has also been an expert witness in cases involving the valuation of work in the home, sex discrimination, and sexual harassment. So with that, I'll have you take it away. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm going to start by reading from my memoir, which was published recently by MIT Press. And it's called Sharing the Work. So I'm going to read from the very beginning of the memoir. Then I'll talk a little bit about how partners can balance family and careers. And then we'll take uh, questions. You'll be able to tell in just a minute when this takes place. It's because you live in Palo Alto, the chairman of Berkeley's economics department tells me. I can't have a regular job here because I live in Palo Alto. He nods. Chairman Brake is tall with football player shoulders, and although I'm tall too, his massive frame towers over me. He's the big shot in one of the most prestigious economics departments in the country. I'm the assistant professor wannabe. If this meeting doesn't go well, he could decide not to hire me for next year. Under my jacket, Rivulets of perspiration are making their way down my dress for success blouse. You have to live in Berkeley to be on your tenure track? Again, he nods. I'm baffled. I never knew that. My husband, Sam, is a medical resident at Stanford and works incredibly long hours. Often he goes back to his lab late at night to check on his experiments. We have to live in Palo Alto. OK, I say softly, getting up to leave. Thanks very much. When I get to my office, my hands are shaking. I can hardly insert my key into the lock. I feel drained, disoriented. Did I take something out of my freezer for tonight's dinner? Lamb chops? Hamburger? I dial home, but Margie, my babysitter, doesn't pick up. She's probably taken the kids out somewhere. I leave my office and walk across Sproul Plaza surprisingly quiet after all the years of student demonstrations. It's 1970, and the Vietnam War is beginning to wind down. I slide into my full-size blue Chevy with a trunk large enough to hold both a stroller and a carriage and review my meeting with Brake. I spend a lot of time in Big Blue these days. It's about an hour between Palo Alto and Berkeley in the morning and longer in the late afternoon, and I do the commute three days a week. Gradually, crawling in stop-and-go traffic toward the Bay Bridge, the absurdity of Brake's answer registers. My first response is to cry. I grope around in my purse, pull out some tissue, and dab at my eyes. But now the road is blurry. I switch my thoughts to my children. Mommy, Mommy, Jason, my three-year-old, will scream with delight when he hears my key in the lock. And Liz, 11 months, will follow his lead. She'll speed across the living room on all fours, tug on my leg, and make joyful noises. Suddenly, the traffic starts to move. I can never tell why the snarls dissolve, but I'm always grateful. As I drive at normal speed, my thoughts turn back to break. But this time, instead of tears, I'm aware of growing anger at myself. What's wrong with you, I scream inside my head. You let him intimidate you. You let him make you mute. 
You're a smart woman and you let him make you look stupid. Faculty don't have to live in Berkeley to be on the tenure track. He fed you pure bull and you bought it. You want to know why you can't have a tenure track job at Berkeley? Look at what's real. There are no women except Margaret in the whole economics department faculty. And although she's been there for more than 20 years, she's still a lecturer. Wake up. The difference between a lecturer and an assistant professor is monumental. Assistant professors have a regular job with an opportunity for promotion and lifetime tenure. Lecturers, on the other hand, are on a road to nowhere. They're appointed from year to year, generally only a few months before their teaching is to begin, and have no chance of advancing. I've worked too hard for too many years to be content with second-class citizenship. I intend to get the real deal at Berkeley. When I finally get onto the Bay Bridge, my anger changes. Now I'm furious with Brake. How dare he tell me I have to live in Berkeley? The radio is tuned to a talk station, and I register Joe Carcioni, the popular green grocer, instructing the whole Bay Area about choosing pumpkins. Ah, Halloween is coming. Maybe I should revisit Brake's office in costume. Which? Skeleton? Big bird? Surely some costume could shake him out of his we-all-have-to-live-in-Berkeley routine. With my sheath skirt and matching man-tailored jacket, I'm wearing stockings and high heels. The stockings feel sticky, and the shoes pinch every time I accelerate. How I would love to kick off those shoes. Whoever invented high heels definitely didn't have driving in mind. I'm getting angrier by the second at the traffic, which has snarled again, at my gluey stockings and too tight high heels, and at my own naivete. But most of all, I'm angry at break. Slowly, I begin to understand what people mean when they say their anger makes them see red. Because a swelling fury, a deep scarlet anger, now floods the car. The steel frame and glass windows can't contain it, and it bursts onto the road like a flaming oil slick a torrent sliding over the bridge's girders and thundering across the bay. As the lights of San Francisco begin to flicker against the darkening sky, I feel a flicker of light within myself. I become a feminist on the Bay Bridge. So the follow-up to that story is, the morning afterwards, I called Brake's office again and asked for another appointment. And his secretary told me he was very busy. It would be several weeks before he could see me. So I had a second meeting several weeks later. And I asked him the same question again. And he asked me if I wanted him to be frank. And I said, yes, I did. And basically, he told me that they knew that I had both a three-year-old and an infant, and that they didn't know what was going to happen to me. I said, happen to me? What do you think is going to happen to me? If you give me a position in six years, I'll come up for tenure and promotion, and we'll all see what happens to me. He said, no. He said, I could never sell that to the department. Well, in the meantime, having nothing to do with me, the women faculty at Berkeley filed a complaint with the Labor Department under a new executive order. And investigators from the Labor Department came to Berkeley. And I thought to myself, you're going to have to sell that to, de to the department. And I was right. Because after two years, I got an assistant professor offer from Berkeley. And if anybody ever tells you that the law doesn't make a difference, argue with them. I also got an assistant professor offer from the Stanford Business School, because although Stanford had not had a complaint filed against them, they were nervous that there might be one. And so in 1972, I was hired as the first woman at the business school. The first woman at the law school was hired. The first woman in engineering was hired, and on and on. So um, I. Uh, wound up teaching at Stanford and not at Berkeley. And I have had 
as one of my fields of study all that time, how partners can balance family and careers. Because as you see, my experience at Berkeley was that they didn't believe that I could possibly balance a career uh, at Berkeley or presumably anywhere else um, and also have young children. So what I want to do now is talk about uh, the main issues that I see for people who do want to balance uh, two careers uh, and, and uh, a family, two demanding careers and a family. So let's take a look at these slides. You can't have it all. As an economist, I'm always perplexed when people ask me the question, can you have it all? Economists are into trade-offs. Nobody can have it all. Something has to be traded off. So you can have two demanding careers and a family, but something has to give. Maybe it's no longer cooking five gourmet meals a week, or playing tennis, or exercising regularly, or seeing your friends as frequently, but something is going to have to change. However, if two people are committed to two careers and a family, it's possible uh, to achieve all of that if they understand what they have to give up in order to do that, and if they're fully committed to two careers. What does it mean to be fully committed to two careers? It means that each spouse has to, or partner has to be committed not only to their own career, but to the other career as well. That's not easy. And there are challenges all along the way. The most important career decision you're going to make is not really a career decision. It's about who you're going to marry or partner with. And if you're already married, and uh, things are not working out well, make sure you have a conversation about this. Make sure you understand what it's about to be committed to two careers. The first challenge is where are we going to live and where are we going to work? Um, and the answer to these questions are different for each couple because the specifics are different. So for example, if one partner is much more mobile than the other partner, then that suggests that the couple should locate where the person who needs more mobility is. Uh, should we take turns advancing our career? You know, should we move here in the first instance for one career and then five years later move uh, for another career move? Uh, sometimes that works out well, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes if you keep switching careers and nobody has priority, then you wind up with two careers that aren't working well. So you have to really think about these issues. They're tough. Should we choose only locations where both people can flourish? Usually that works well. And usually that means a fairly large area. So you know the Bay Area, Los Angeles, New York, Chicago, Atlanta, places where both members of a couple can find jobs and move up. Should we have a commuter marriage? That's tough. Uh, the literature seems to suggest that a commuter marriage works for a while if it's time limited, if both people know that it's not going to last forever. And of course, if there are children involved, then a commuter marriage is really tough. How about dividing housework and home management? Well, you may be able to outsource a good deal of housework, but unless you're extremely rich, uh, you and your partner will be managing your home. Um, how will you divide the management work? People often forget about the management function. You know, they decide who's going to cook and who's going to clean up, but they forget, you know, somebody has to be involved in who's going to call the plumber. But somebody has to know that a plumber has to be called, okay? Somebody has to know that you have to sign up the kids for camp before all the slots are filled. Those are all management functions. Are you going to be co-CEOs, or are you going to divide up the function? If you're going to be co-CEOs, then you have to have a lot of communication, as is always the case when there's more than one uh, CEO involved. Deciding when and if to have a child. Well, from a, people always ask me, when is the best time to have a child? The answer is that it's always the best time, and it's always the worst time. 
Now, if you want a child, it's the best time whenever you have a child. Um, but a child is likely to slow your career to some degree. And if you're both members of the couple are sharing childcare, then it may slow both careers. So again, this is a tough decision. How are you going to care for your children? Well, leaving the workforce, one, one member of the couple leaving the workforce um, is one possibility. Uh, and more and more uh, dads are leaving the workforce. But that is a very costly decision. The person who leaves the workforce uh, generally loses a good deal of his or her network, unless they make a really conscious effort to maintain that network. Often their skills depreciate, unless again they make a very conscious effort to keep those skills going. And the literature shows that when you come back, when women come back, there's not enough men coming back from childcare to, to study it yet. But when women come back, their earnings are permanently lower by as much as 20%. Now this could be because of the jobs they choose or because their new bosses don't see them as good material for promotion because they've taken time out. But in any case, uh, the combination of factors leads to an earnings decrement. Also, people lose insurance in case of divorce because if you have to come back to the workforce in case of divorce and you haven't been in the workforce for a long time, you're going to have a, lo a lot of trouble uh, getting back in. Part-time work is another potential solution, but often it's not a very good solution. Uh, it can be the worst of all worlds because often employers don't pay uh, per hour what you would get if you had a full-time job. Benefits are often lower. Uh, often employers don't see people who work time part-time as good candidates for promotion. And the other problem that people tell me about all the time is that even though they've negotiated a part-time schedule, they wind up working full-time. So now it is the worst of both worlds um, because you're working full-time, but you only have a part-time salary. So where part-time seems to work best is when you've already been a full-time person and you negotiate for part-time in a limited way. So you say, you know, I'm, I'm coming back from having a child, um, and I want to work part-time for the next six months. Can we work that out? So that, that seems to be a good solution there. Inform yourselves about child care options early, like when you know you're going to have a child, uh, because it's often difficult to find good quality child care. And we know that good quality child care is beneficial to children, uh, but not all child care is good quality. And inform yourselves about what to look for in terms of the quality of child care. Now, people always talk about balancing work and family. But that could be not the ideal metaphor. Because if you think of balance as you know, the scales of justice with equality, for most people, work and family is not equal. You know, for some, work is higher. For some, family is higher. Um, but it doesn't mean that the balance has to be you know, equal. Um, I think the better notion is uh, the jar of life. So figure out what things in your life are the rocks. What are the things that really should go into that jar? And put those things in first. So after the jar is filled with rocks, then the pebbles can all, you know, pebbles and the sand can all fill in around the rocks. But you know that you fit in the most important stuff. And I think in striving for balance, it's probably fruitless to imagine that your work and family life is going to be in balance every day, every week, maybe not even every month. But what's important is that you both continually work to move back into what you decide is the right balance. And I like to think about a band of acceptability. Okay, so my work family is in balance within this band. And if I'm out here, or my family is out here, then we agree that we gotta get back into our band of acceptability. We gotta change some things to get back. 
So I like that notion of work-family balance rather than uh, the scales of equality. And finally, let me just say that you know, work-family balance is not just about you and your family. Many of you are or will be in a position to help other people to balance their work and family. And uh, when you make decisions with your employees, people who report to you about how they're going to be able to balance work and family, think about the power that you have uh, to make their life uh, more livable. And also think about how we can jointly put more flexibility into the entire system. As you probably know, uh, the United States is the only industrialized country without uh, paid uh, leave for maternity, let alone paternity. Uh, we need to change that. And we have no childcare system. The last time there was a bill in Congress uh, for a childcare system was 1971. And Nixon vetoed that bill. And no bill has come to Congress since then. So uh, Hillary Clinton now has a, a plan for a child care system. But it's been 45 years uh, since Congress took up the notion of a uh, child care system for the country. So there's work to do, obviously, in your own family, in your workplace, and in the society as a whole. Thank you. I've always put about 30% on as the figure for how much extra our family spends that it wouldn't if one parent stayed home full time. And that's for house cleaning, takeout, guilt gifts for the kid. <laughs> um, is that an accurate figure? Have you got any stats on that? I don't have stats on that. But I think that as families make decisions about whether both parents should work or not, um, you don't want to make a decision based on short-run factors. So you know, what some people do is they say, you know, this is the salary that the second earner could earn in the workplace. And here's what we have to pay for all the factors you talked about, child care, extra cleaning, takeout, often an extra car. OK. So, you know, does it pay? Is my salary or the other person's salary high enough to cover all those costs? So I don't think that's a good way to think about this, because this is not a short run issue. This is a long term issue. And if you take into account the decrease in salary that's going to take place when the person who left the workforce comes back, then over a lifetime of, well, not a lifetime, but a work lifetime, um, those child care costs and guilt gifts, and I love that, guilt gifts, and extra cleaning and whatever are going to be minimal. It's really an economic investment to pay for those things in order to keep a person in the workforce, keep those skills current, keep those networks up, and, and get the income from the second person. And also, it's not a good idea to think about, you know, will the second person's salary cover these expenses? Because really, these are family expenses, and you don't want to think about them as having the second earner needing to cover those expenses. You know, both, both people are responsible. Uh, I have a question and uh, around kind of the lean-in movement and having women who are uh, you know, going on maternity leave, coming back, reporting in to me, everyone has different experiences around it. Uh, for me, I read the book at a very powerful time when I had my first child, and it kind of inspired me to really come back and come back full force. But I have a lot of women who, when we talk about it, they feel that there's almost double pressure. So I've had a different experience. I actually think the lean-in movement and all the research has been helpful in my career on sticking with the workforce. But there are people who, that report to me that say it's put too much pressure on them as women. I'm curious in your research at Stanford and your engagement how you address it. And I know it's not one size fits all, right? But ultimately, how do you respond to women that feel, God, there's so much pressure to be amazing moms, to be fully full throttle into our career as well? 
So I think the point you make that no one size fits all is the key. And we have very interesting discussions in my classes. I teach a class at the Stanford Business School on work and family. And 40% of the students are men. And some of them have had a fair amount of work experience because they're back for what used to be known at the business school as the Sloan program. Now it has some other name, MSX or something. Um, and so a lot of those men are very proud of the way in which they helped women to handle uh, coming back to work after pregnancy. And so they talk about what they did. And invariably, some woman will raise her hand and say, that's not what I want when I come back. So your point that different women want different things. One woman will say, when I come back, I want to be full force. I don't want anybody to change my travel schedule. I don't want anybody to change my uh, you know, number of meetings. I, I want to be there full force. And others will say what some of your reports say. No, I can't handle that right now. I need to move over a little bit. Uh, take away some of my responsibilities, and in a few years, I'd like to be able to move back. That's the key. It used to be that the so-called mommy track you know, took away responsibilities, but then you were gone. You were gone from the screen. And when you said you wanted to come back, the answer was, too bad for you. You've missed the train. Uh, you can't get on that track anymore, which is really a foolish way to think about human resources. You know, you were out for a few years, so now we're never going to use you full force again. Uh, but the manager really has to have a conversation with the report to find out what's, what's desired. And the second thing about that is, you know, people can change their mind. So you have that conversation before the woman, or even the man, leaves for uh, family leave. And then they come back, and they have a different perception. I mean, so many things can happen. They might have a child with special needs. Well, they didn't anticipate that when they told you they wanted to come back full force. Or they might find that their own health is not as strong as they thought it was going to be for whatever reason. So yes, it's good to have a conversation before the person goes out on leave, see what they're thinking. But then the real key is to have the conversation when they're ready to come back. And you know, I think lean in is very important because it says, you know, try to do. But I, th I think Sheryl Sandberg's main message is don't leave before you leave. That's critical. You know, keep going full force for as long as you can, assuming your health is good. Uh, but I think that you know, leaning in is only part of the story. I think that you need to have employers who meet you halfway. Otherwise, I always tell my students, if you keep leaning in and nobody's there to meet you, you're just going to fall over. So that doesn't do anybody any good. So yes, you need to work hard, but employers need to have policies uh, that meet people halfway. I, I think that Deloitte has done a really good job of trying to figure out how to have lots of different um, paths after people leave the workforce or come back part time, um, and then you know, as they're ready to uh, resume uh, full tilt, then they're welcomed to do that. I think that's really ideal. Is what is a real world example of a band of acceptability agreement a couple could have in place in their relationship? Well, one one aspect of the band of acceptability might have to do with how many nights a week the family eats dinner together. So, you know, seven is one possibility, but you might say, look, it's fine if, um, you know, one partner misses dinner with the family one night a week and a second partner misses dinner with the family. So now the family's going to have dinner five nights a week. Or maybe the couple's going to go out for dinner by themselves one night a week. So now the family eats together four nights a week. When children get older, that may be impossible, not because of the parents' work schedule, but because of the kids' sports schedules. You know? So then you might say, OK, every Sunday morning, our family is going to have a pancake breakfast together. And that's, you know, nothing can interfere with that. 
So that would be a band of acceptability. Or you could have um, acceptability rules about travel. So how many nights a month is it OK for one or the other partner uh, to be outside the city, in some other city? OK? Is it fine five nights a week, um, four nights a week, um, you know, 10 days a month? Whatever your family decides is right. Then if things begin to move toward more and more nights away, you can sit down and say to one another, wait a minute, look, this, is, this isn't what we said we wanted to do. Something has to change here. So that would be an example. Um, it's common for working mothers to be asked why they have children if their children will spend most of their waking hours with someone else. How do you think about the role of a working parent, and in particular, how best to measure your contribution to your children if you can't win on quote unquote time? Although you may be away for many of the child's waking hours, you as a parent are going to be right there for other of those working, of those, uh, of the child's hours. Uh, certainly on the weekends, in the evening, in the early morning. Um, and I think parents have a tremendous effect on their children, uh, even if their children are in childcare or if they're raised by uh, a third parent, like a grandparent or a nanny. Um, one of the interesting ways to think about this is um, when a child is cared for not only by his or her parents but also by another person and the other person has a different accent, the child picks up the parent's accent. So, you know, over hundreds of years, uh, English royal children were raised by people who didn't necessarily have the upper class English accent, and somehow or other those children figure out which accent they're supposed to imitate. And I think that's true for not just language. I think children know very early who their parents are and um, the kind of love that they get from those parents, hopefully. And um, there's a bond that isn't created by a nanny or a child care worker or um, even a grandparent. Uh, there's a different kind of love with a grandparent. So I think there's plenty of hours in the week for parents to interact with their kids, to show them they love them. And you know, I'm just amazed all the time by my students and former students who talk about ways in which they have created to interact with their children even when they're traveling. So now we have Skype. I mean, that's a phenomenal way to be involved with your kids. Before that, we had phone conversations. Um, so I, I just think that children know who their parents are and know the kind of love that they get from those parents. And you know, also, st students tell me that when they can't be at their child's uh, ballet recital, they uh, have somebody there who videotapes it, and then they sit with the child and watch the videotape, and they say, no, that's even better than having been in the audience, because now we can stop the tape, we can talk about what the child was doing and feeling. So I think with technology and with a little bit of thinking about this, uh, parents can have very uh, fruitful relationships with their parents, with their children, even if they're working hard. My question is about the body of work available on this subject. How much research is available with children being the subjects? There's a tremendous amount of research available. Um, my daughter-in-law, Joanna Strober, and a co-author, Sharon Mears, have a book called uh, Getting to 50-50, which was published, um, I think, 2009, maybe. Um, and that has a review of the research up to that time. Uh, from be for beyond that, really, you can go on to the internet and find a tremendous amount of research. If you want to, you know, Google Scholar is terrific on this uh, to find the, the serious journal articles. But also government publications, there's just an enormous amount of stuff out there. Too much. It's hard to sift through it. This kind of gray area where men they're not leaning out, and it's, they're not the primary caregiver, but they are potentially taking a little bit of a valley in their career to support potentially a woman. 
their partner who's really full force. It could be a new job, it could be a move. And uh, just the way, is our society evolved enough to accept it? And, and it comes from a personal example. I've moved from New York for this Google position. It's, it's a fairly big job. My husband's kind of leaning in and supporting me. And he, he, it's interesting, he shares with me, he's still working, he's running his business, but it's not at the New York base. And a lot of um, parents in school, and just he does more of the drop-offs, kind of always hint to him like, hey, when are you gonna get back in? When you, and he's like, I'm in. I'm just not in at 120% like Rolina is right now, because Google's new, it's intense. It's interesting, this gray area that maybe people don't wanna talk about. And I'm curious if you see this, when the men are kind of supporting their wives, but then society thinks that they've completely leaned out. I don't know. Just curious. I think it's really tough for men who are trying to make these changes uh, because they do get those kinds of comments. Um, and they, they have to be not only strong in terms of their career, they have to be strong in facing all these other, usually mothers, who have all these uh, <laughs> words about what they should and shouldn't be doing. And you know, I've often thought it would be fun to have a class for men who are, as you say, uh, leaning in uh, to support their wives, uh, to give them some comments that they might offer in return uh, for these negative comments about um, you know, when are you going to get back in and so on. Um, you know, I, I just think that whenever you're a pioneer, you have to face these societal norms uh, that haven't changed yet. And in my book, uh, Sharing the Work, you know, I was a pioneer. I was the first woman at the Stanford Business School. And the book is filled with these kinds of uh, discussions about what I had to face. Now, the pioneers are people like your husband, who are really bucking the trends um, and are saying, no, my wife has gotten a great job at Google, and I'm going to support her, and she's going all the way, and I'm still staying in, but I'm doing more childcare than I might have done otherwise. And um, you know, I think you have to you have to be a pioneer, and you have to be strong. <laughs> Can you talk about challenges taking care of aging parents and family members, and any nuances to what you've covered with regard to partnering balance on this top? Sorry, with regard to partnering slash balance on this topic versus childcare balance. That's a really important question. Um, I didn't have a section on elder care in my work family course. Uh, until maybe seven or eight years ago when one of the men in my class did a paper on elder care. And at the bottom of his paper he said, I think this topic should be in the class. And I thought to myself, yes, it really should. And so since that time we do have the topic in the class. And in many ways elder care is more challenging than child care. I mean, even though children may be rebellious, basically the parents are in charge. You know, the parents make the decisions and you know, try to get the children to go along. That's not true with elder care. Uh, adult children are not in charge of their parents. Uh, adult children have to wait for their parents to make decisions that they can support, they can try to influence them, but the parents are in charge. The other thing is that you know, children grow up so child care is only for a few years. And then they become teenagers, which is a whole different story. But you know, then they stop being teenagers and they grow up more. With elder care, you don't know how long your parent is going to need care. Um, you don't know whether the situation is going to get better or more likely worse. Um, it's much less predictable. They often don't live in the same city where you live. And the statistics seem to show that more days are lost from work by adults doing elder care than child care. Because child care is predictable. So you can line up help. But elder care, particularly if you have to go uh, to another state to take care of your parent, is not predictable. And I think elder care is still not talked about much in the workplace. A lot of people don't want their manager to know that they're involved in elder care because they're spending a lot of time at work doing this. And so I believe this is the topic for the future 
with regard to work family balance. And you know, if there's an emergency with your parent, there is no balance, none at all. You know, 150% of your time and effort is involved in trying to deal with this emergency. And then you have to make all the other arrangements, especially if you're in the so-called sandwich generation, where you not only have elder parents, but you have young children. So then you're really running from one to the other to try to, to get the balance that you need. Interestingly, more and more studies show that men are more involved in elder care. So it used to be when wives were at home and not in the workplace, that they did the elder care not only for their parents, but also for their husband's parents. But that's not so true anymore. So more and more men are doing the care for their own parents and um, really stepping up to that. So again, that's a, that's a whole new sort of pioneering. Can you give any guidance on the proper timing and method to start speaking with your manager about your um, decision to start family planning? So I think this idea of when you should talk to your manager also uh, is very specific, um, very, this, the specifics of the situation are really important. If you know that your manager is going to be helpful um, and isn't going to say to you something like, oh, God, why'd you go and do that? You could have had a great career. Um, then you might want to talk to your manager early on. If you think your manager is not going to be supportive, you might want to wait a little bit more before you talk. But you know, pregnancy has a way, particularly for women, of showing. And so your manager is going to find out <laughs> at some point or other. And it's probably better if you talk to your manager before he or she can see that you're pregnant. Um, and so I think the best example I know is a former student of mine who was in strategic planning at a tech company. This was years ago. And she went into her manager early on and said, this is the plan. This is the strategic plan <laughs> for my pregnancy and, and uh, childbirth. So here is a, a flow chart. And here's what I'm going to be doing for the next six months. And then I'm going to take some time off. And I'm going to check in at each of these points. And then after you know, six months, I'm coming back full time. Um, and she said, you can't find anybody to do this job better than I can given this strategic plan I just gave you. And he sort of said, bless you. <laughs> uh, so you know, if you say what you want and how are you going to do it, and you're confident, and of course, everybody has to understand that things might not quite work out that way depending on what happens. But you know, you can say with 90% confidence, perhaps, that this is what is going to happen. Here, here's what we're going to do. I was wondering if you could share some of your uh, suggestions for how to make that dip in a career for you know a couple of two young professionals uh, with let's say um, six relatively successful careers. Uh, when I took your class, I remember you talked about one suggestion, which was hiring a night uh, nanny, even though it's quite expensive, but there's actually quite a lot of benefit of getting a good night's sleep for both partners and then having a more productive day and the psychological. So I was hoping to get a refresher on things like that. Well, of course, you know, if you have um, a lot of money, then there are lots of solutions, like a night nanny. Um, if you are not in such a great financial situation, then of course you're more limited. And you have to be more creative. When I see graduate students at Stanford who, by definition, do not have a lot of money, well, unless you know, their parents have a tremendous amount of money, but they don't have a lot of money, they use a co-op method. So they, when, when they want to go out to a movie or they want to go out for dinner or date night or something, uh, they probably won't go out for a movie, but you know, to, for, for out for dinner, just the two of them, um, instead of hiring a babysitter, which can cost you know, more than the dinner, um, they will trade off. 
So they'll say, you know, tonight we're going to go out for dinner. You watch both your children and mine. And then, you know, tomorrow night you go and I'll watch yours. I think there's lots of ways of cooperating with other people who also have young children that work out very well. Even, you know, would you take my child uh, for the afternoon so I can get a nap? Uh, if your child's not napping anymore. Otherwise, try to nap when the child naps. You know, that's always a good thing. <laughs> but um, you know, I think your question is wonderful because it shows you that you have to think creatively about how to do this. You know, it was easier in the old days where you had lots of family living around you and you could just drop your kid off for a few hours with somebody in your family. Now you have to arrange those kinds of of um, new family arrangements with, with people who are actually you know, friends by choice rather than family members. But truly, if you, if you have a lot of money, I mean, I know people who hire more than one nanny. You know, the, some nanny comes you know, from eight to six, and another nanny comes from five to nine, and, and then if the child is a newborn and not sleeping through the night, they might hire a night nurse. So all of those things are possible for a very few people. So this is sort of adding on to the, the co-op question, but how important is it, is it to have a network of women at your job once you come back that are sort of experiencing the same experiences as you are? Well, I don't think it's necessarily um, necessary to have it at your job. Uh, some women prefer to have a network of women doing the same thing they're doing but at other companies so that they can be, you know, 100% frank about what's going on and not worry that somebody is at their own workplace. Other people like to have a network at their workplace. But no matter how you slice it, a network is key. I know when I was raising my kids, um, there were very few professional women. And uh, my network consisted of my kids' friends, mothers at their nursery school. So they, they weren't professional women at all. But they were so helpful to me uh, in, in so many ways. Um, you know, if my babysitter couldn't come because she had a family emergency, I would call one of them and they would take my children home with them, you know, at lunchtime. And um, you, you can't do this just by yourself. <laughs> and of course, the luckiest thing is if you can get your parents to move <laughs> near where you are <laughs> or you move back. I mean, I had a student who, she and her husband moved back to Shanghai because that's where their parents were and they could not imagine doing this kind of thing without their parents' help. So, you know, the geographic location had nothing to do with their two careers. It had to do with where their parents were. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Cool.